Hey guys, Eric here. Excited today. I've got an exclusive video. I've got a special guest today, founder and CEO of Blend Labs, Nima Gansari. Nima, how are you today? Doing well. Thanks for having me, Eric. Absolutely. I, it's a pleasure. I appreciate your time. This is going to be really fun. So, you know, full disclosure before we start, I am a, a shareholder of Blend Labs. I own some shares of stock, ticker BLND. And I've done a lot of research on this, this company and this stock, both for Fired Up Wealth and The Motley Fool. We've done a lot of due diligence on, on your company. So what, what I'm going to do today, though, is I'm going to pretend like if somebody's watching this video for the first time and don't know anything about your company, they can get an understanding of what you guys are all about. So to kind of kick it off, what is Blend Labs exactly? What's your company do? So financial services, banking, the way that fintechs have come up, it's transforming from a very paper-based industry to a very digital data-driven industry. And so that means that the old way of getting a loan, which was you show up at a bank, you fill out a bunch of paperwork in person. A few days later, someone gets back to you with an answer, a yes or a no, or more request for more information. That's transforming to, in a matter of seconds on your phone, you can see exactly everything the financial services sector can do for you in, in your pocket. And I think that's, that's really, that transformation is really special but the technology that's required to support that, the infrastructure is, was built for financial services was built 50 years ago. So think of Blend as a modern software layer that's used by banks and credit unions. It's white labeled, it's all under the hood, it's powered by Blend. You think of Stripe as infrastructure for payments, Blend as infrastructure for lending and banking. And so we're, we're that software layer that's being used by banks, by fintechs, credit unions, also home builders, all sorts of financial services companies to power that transformation into the modern era of of consumer financial services. We have about 300 plus customers ranging from the biggest banks, the biggest credit unions, the biggest fintechs, um, and also small community banks, the credit unions and, and fintechs as well. And so, um, and we've been around nine years uh, and we're continually expanding the layers that we, of which we provide uh, service because that digital transformation, while it's well underway and you probably see that across the industry, uh, there's still a lot of work to do. It's still mostly done on paper. Most of these products are mostly done on paper. And so we're uh, we're continuing that journey for for decades. And if I remember correctly, you had a former employer that you're working with, and you worked with some of these large financial institutions, correct? What, who was that? What was that company that you used to work for? I used to work for a company called Palantir, and I joined right before the financial crisis, the last financial crisis, 2008. And then right then, the, the crisis hit, and we were working with some financial services firms, and they said, "Can you help us with their mortgage with our mortgage books?" I didn't know anything about mortgages at the time, but what I did know was when I walked in to these companies, their software layer was software that was basically just paper. It was, like, it, was, it was a layer above paper. It was a very old, old school mainframe infrastructure. And so there was, I saw there was a lot of opportunity. And so I left Palantir a few years later to start Blend. Okay. That's a really good background. It's, what's interesting about it too. So before I, I did this for a living, I'm basically a stock analyst now. Before that, I had about 10 years in real estate mortgage. I was actually a realtor and I originated loans. And then I went into software and software as a service for about 10 years. So 20 years experience. So when I think of Blend Labs and your company, it really kind of ties together my backgrounds. So I feel like I know this company really well. And I understand some of the pain points that some of these larger banks and institutions have trying to, to digitize and modernize and stay, you know, really relevant and up to beat with some of these other companies that are disrupting in the fintech sector. And I cover a lot of fintech companies as well. So when you think about Blend Labs, okay, you think about Blend Labs, when you think of software as a service company, SaaS companies, the market generally gives, pays a premium for those type of companies. When you think of title insurance, you know, you think of insurance types type companies, they don't receive the same type of multiples and they don't get that same kind of premium. And so I honestly feel like I understand your business pretty well. I think the market might be confused on just really how to value Blend Labs. And so the question I have is, if you were to explain to somebody, why do you believe it's important to have insurance and title as pillars of your business? Well, the reality is insurance and title are part of the financial services ecosystem around these products. And so when you think about the old way people used to get insurance and title as part of this process, it was through referrals from whether a loan officer or their realtor. And it was also, it was very opaque. It was usually you'd go to one person and they'd get you one rate. And so you wouldn't be sure you're getting the best rate. And it was very paper-based a lot of steps in the process. And the way the blend has done it now is we embed it in the mortgage process for a mortgage, for example. And same thing over time with other products like a car loan needs car insurance. There's a digital marketplace. You choose your title, your insurance provider, and then it immediately fulfills that policy. So it's all done on software. And so just like the banking industry is transforming into this more digital data-driven industry, 
so is so are these ecosystem providers of title insurance and home insurance and other even realty is going to change over time like being a realtor is going to be a little bit different in 10 years than it is today maybe a lot different but when i think about title and and, and home insurance those things are becoming this they're they're having the same digital transformation and if we want to serve the consumer for these financial services firms end to end across these products we have to be able to serve the, the full stack okay. it's kind of like what shopify has done Shopify has taken things that were previously maybe thought of as more manual, less high margin businesses, and it's transformed them into these higher margin businesses and layered them in so that their merchants get a full service suite of solutions. It's the same thing our financial services firms want. They want an end to end journey. They don't want a piecemeal thing that they have to go send their customer to five different providers. And those providers might be working against the interests of the consumer and the financial services firm. And so, yeah, we've gotten a lot of pull into those areas. And I think those areas are going to under, they're undergoing a similar transformation that the banking is going through. So we think it's very important that we're driving that transformation. Now, I realize that for investors, it's a little confusing because, you know, they probably look at these industries as different industries. You know, why would Blend play in that? We're a marketplace provider in these industries. And so we think that's super important to drive that digital transformation and it will become software over time. That, that's really good insight. And it's really helpful hearing it from you. It's really about that one-stop shop experience. And I think comparing it to Shopify, uh, that, that really makes a lot of sense. So I appreciate that. Now, on the recent earnings call, we had earnings not too long ago. We heard the following quote. On the new product front, we launched a new product called Blend Income, which is an easy way for lenders to verify the income of their consumers. We have over 50 customers already signed up for that. Could you please provide us some insight on this new product? Is it something you feel that can be a significant revenue and growth driver or... Tell us more about it. Sure. So the basic premise of the income product is almost every loan in the country in the U.S. needs income verification of some sort, whether you're self-employed or your gig economy or your W-2. We need to know that you can pay back the loan before we give you the loan. And the old way of doing that was somebody provides some pay slips or their proof of bank statements or whatever it is, and somebody then reads that, gets back to them a few days later. But that doesn't allow for those real-time in-your-pocket experiences that I was talking about. And so what Blend is launched is an instant real-time income verification tool that's embedded in the flow. And it was something that when we launched, I had high aspirations for it, of course, because I think, like I said, every loan needs it and this provides a superior experience. But the uptake from our customers has been even more accelerated than I thought it would be. And I think part of the reason is because there's a huge pain point around this. Doing this process is expensive and it's bad customer and it's a bad customer experience. And so we got, we launched it officially, uh, I think in October was when our press release was around this. And we have so many customers signed up. Getting financial services firms to sign up for something is a lot of work. But they, they came to us. They were buying from us as opposed to us selling to them because they, they, this is such an obvious pain point. So I think it's going to be a huge driver of value for them and for their consumers. The, the price per unit is similar to our price per unit for our base platform. And so it's a significant revenue opportunity if we get the attach rates, if we get the customers sign up, which we have. Um, and once we get them rolled out, we'll start to see that. But yeah, I think it's a huge opportunity for us and for our customers to, to deliver a differentiated experience. That's really good. Can you help us understand? Now, I, I have some insight into this, but help the, the viewer understand. On the SaaS side, how do you guys recognize that revenue? So is it a subscription, is a service type model, plus consumption, disconsumption? Tell us more about that. It's a lot like how, how you would see a Twilio or you know another consumption or Snowflake or another consumption-based model. So if you're familiar with kind of the, these high-growth software companies, a similar model to them. The reason we do consumption based is because we want our customers to be able to sign up with us. Like I said, signing, getting these companies to sign with us, getting 300 plus financial institutions to sign with us is a huge bear. But part of the reason that we've made that possible is by making it really easy to sign up with us. And so the consumption based model takes a lot of risk off the table for them, allows them to get started. And then as they grow their volumes over time, they can start to commit to some. So they do commit to some volume with us over time. But at the start, we let them get started with no commitment. So they can get, we, we can get in the door with them. We also shared our retention numbers right. in the last earnings call, which our gross retention is 99% almost every quarter or higher, which is amazing. And our net retention is very high as well, 150, 160% in, that, in those ranges. And so those retention numbers proved to us that our customers liked our product. And if they signed with us, if we got in the door, we would grow with them. We would keep them. We would find new ways to service them, like with the income product or title or home insurance. And so there was a lot of opportunity for us to not just get in the door with them easily, but then grow with them over time. We didn't want them to have heartburn that we right. were just like every other vendor. And if they signed with us, they'd sign a huge contract and then maybe it wouldn't work. So we just, we took that off the table and we said, we're going to prove ourselves. And we've done that for years. 
Let's talk real quick about Mr. Cooper. Now I'm familiar with Mr. Cooper. I actually used to originate some loans. I even had a loan with them at one point. I believe they're Texas based and they're pretty big. I think they're, they're around $3 billion in sales or something like that a year, a little, a little under $3 billion. So when you think of that, when you think of Mr. Cooper, I think that they're going to be going live on your blend platform in, I think, is it Q2 early 2022, I believe, correct? That's right. um, how big is this going to be for your business? I mean, I know you can't tell me specifics, but you see this being a big opportunity for, for Blend Labs? Yeah, I mean, they're one of the largest lenders in the country. And not only are they one of the largest lenders in the country, but they've also signed up for our Blend title offering. They've signed up for our Blend close offering. And so it's not just going to be just the base platform. It's going to be the other things like Blend close and Blend title and hopefully other things like Blend income over time. So the fact that they're a very close partner of ours, we think very highly of them. The fact that they're such a good partner of ours means that we can do more and more with them over time, drive real value to their customers and have that kind of mutual value creation together. And so um, I'm very excited. I think it's going to be extremely significant to our business overall. And we are, I, you know, I just wish, you know, I, like all the things in business, I wish things could happen faster, but right. we have to do things the right way too, um, because we're in an industry where money changes hand, a lot of money changes hands with consumers and we have to be able to make sure that the things that we roll out work really well at huge scale and those millions of consumers can get the right product and get it in the most frictionless way possible. And so I don't want to rush it, but that's why the Q2 time horizon is there. This is a really good question. I think it's helpful for investors. When you think of interest rates right now, the market's having some gyrations, especially with growth stock names. And they're predicted to, you know, by a lot of people to, to go higher next year, right? So 2022 and 2023, we're going to see a a spike in interest rates. And of course, because of the pandemic, we had a huge boost in certain businesses and even the housing market. You know, people really wanted to have something different. They got sick of their house sitting around. They wanted to, to move to a different place, what have you. And so some investors might have concerns investing in businesses like Blend Labs that rely heavily on mortgages and just the real estate market overall. It's a cyclical type market. So what are your thoughts on that? Do you have anything to share to kind of provide some insight for an investor that might say, hey, I'm not so sure about investing in companies that are related to a cyclical market. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I have three, three thoughts on that. One, the amount of market share we have, just under 15%, there's still a ton of room to grow above that. You know, we, we have 10% roughly of the market that's already signed with us that's not fully rolled out yet. So we, we released these numbers in our last earnings call. And then another 75% that we haven't signed with yet. And so we have a lot of room to grow on our just base volume. So that's the first thought is that there's a ton of work to do. Second, even within mortgage, the amount of add-ons, the amount of things that we can do on top of that, blend income is one example, blend title is another example, and there's more, more of those things over time. We haven't even touched the appraisal space. The amount of things we can add to our volume will just increase the value that we're creating per unit for our customers. And so as we add these additional services on top, we'll not only grow our market share with our customers that we have been, we'll also be adding the value per unit that we're doing. And so there's a lot of, again, we're at the beginning of this digital transformation in, in mortgage. And then the last thought, we're at the beginning of this digital transformation in broader financial services. And so our expansion, the, the, the entire consumer product set that a financial services firm can offer has been, has been growing really fast. We shared our breakout of non-mortgage platform business this time as well. It grew from 11% um, last year to 19% in the consumer banking and marketplaces um, businesses. And that is a fast growing part of our business that we think is a good harbinger for things that are going to come where there's just a lot of opportunity to, to continue to drive digitization. And we're the provider of choice for these financial services firms. So we want to keep working with them, want to keep creating new innovative things. And we have been hard at work at that. So I, there's, those are the three things that I would say. I understand there's hesitation around markets, there's hesitation around interest rates and volumes, but it, un, that underestimates how much this industry is going to transform over the next decade. That's really good. So we heard this on the conference call. This is a quote, and this is to help provide insight for anybody that maybe didn't listen to the earnings call. The market was down over 25% year over year, and our revenues were up in the blend platform segment over 25%. So I think that's pretty impressive when you think of that. The actual overall market was down, and you guys are still you know, growing significantly. So I think that's important for, for listeners to, to hear and kind of piggyback off of what you just said. Now, one thing I want to point out, I think this would be helpful for investors too. So the Q3 gap loss per share of 38 cents was unchanged from a year ago quarter. It came in wider than the 11 cent loss estimate. That was the consensus. So the non-gap net loss of $26.9 million widened from a loss basically of $14 million 
in the previous quarter year over year. What what I think would be helpful for investors to understand, I I feel like the acquisition of Title 365 and the additional headcount might have actually made those expenses kind of a one-time deal more expensive than maybe the analysts thought. But I'd like to, and if you can't answer it, it's fine. But I wanted to ask the question, do you have any insight on why we had that that wider than expected loss? Well, a lot of it was due to there was a one-time stock-based compensation adjustment we had to do around the IPO. Um, and I, you know, I think we we actually probably knew about that. I don't think the analysts knew about that potentially. I, I don't know exactly what the, the disconnect was there, but those were things that we had been planned before the IPO. Those were one-time and there. Those are stock-based compensation losses, um, a little bit different from an accounting perspective. I'm not going to go into it on, on sure, this call, no. but yeah, but, um, but that was the primary, that was a big part of it. That was a huge yeah. part of it. And then there are one-time expenses related to acquisition, you know, from an ongoing day-to-day of the business, our expenses, our cash expenses, the things that we're spending money on are not higher than we expected. Um, right. It's just that these are these are some accounting things that we have to make sure we do we get right because getting our accounting right is obviously very important to the business, even when it's not a cash um, a cash item. That's really helpful. I, I appreciate that. It makes a lot of sense when you say it. I think a lot of times, you know, there's knee jerk reactions you see in earnings call and you say, oh well, they missed earnings, and that's why the due diligence is so important, and that's what we try to help people with to understand what's going on behind the scenes because there are a lot of complexities, especially with the new IPO that you may or may not be familiar with as an investor. So this is a good question. I think it'll be an interesting one. So do you see any opportunities to leverage artificial intelligence, AI? I've, I've covered a lot on artificial intelligence, have like a whole series that talks about AI type stocks. And do you see any opportunities to leverage AI in your mortgage products? And I won't mention the, the, the company by name, but you'll probably know who I'm talking about. And if you want to mention the name, you can. So there's a well-known FinTech, right? That's kind of a a recent company that's been doing really well, making a name for itself, kind of upending traditional lending process using AI. Now they're not doing mortgages right now. It's more personal loans and autos. And for now that's where they're, they're focused. There's a chance that they could maybe branch out into other segments later. So is something like that a threat to Blend Labs or is it an opportunity for a potential partnership? Well, I'm not sure about partnering with them specifically. I, know, I think I know who you're talking about, but there is a real opportunity for AI in this space and in two, in two realms, three realms, actually. One is around helping a lot of what, how financial services is transforming is it's transforming from being a very reactive uh, mode where you go and apply for a product to a more proactive mode, more like Amazon. Let me recommend the product that's going to improve your financial life. That takes real artificial intelligence to do that kind of thing. So that's one bucket. Um, the second bucket is around uh, processing the, the, the loans that are happening today. So there's a lot of work that's done by humans around when documents have to be provided, when data is not available, humans go and review those documents, extract data from those documents, do the work to process that data and say you're approved or not. Those documents are roughly um, still like 60, 70% of the, the market and how, how that's done. So I think there's a real opportunity to make the processing done better by AI. We announced a couple partnerships recently around that. I don't know if you saw those. Those are really great companies that are sort of the future of AI. One, you know, one of them is called Scale AI, for example. And then the last piece, and we don't have anything in this today, but I think this is where traditionally people have played in the AI space is around AI for underwriting. The, the risk of AI for underwriting, which is, you know, helping, you know, better predict losses and things like that. The risk around that is just around making sure that you do fair lending, you do things in, a, in a, an appropriate way. You don't have bias in your AI um, against certain groups. And so that has to be approached very carefully. But I think it is, a, it is long term, it is a very good opportunity for, for banks and lenders. The, the, those are all three of those are areas that I think long term blend will help our customers with because they want to get into those things, but they maybe don't have this. Some of them don't have the scale. And the ones that do have the scale maybe don't have all the tools yet to be able to implement those things. And so Blend as their software provider of choice is a natural fit to come to, to, uh, to help roll those things out. That's really good. I appreciate the insight on that. So on the, on the recent earnings call, there was also a brief mention of the future possibility of using, in quotes, digital assets. Now, I presume that's something like blockchain technology when you think of developing digital identity or digital financial identity use cases. Um, have you seen further development in these efforts? And if so, would that technology make a stronger case for future customers to migrate to the Blend ecosystem? This was actually asked by a person named Alfred in our group. And so I appreciate Alfred kind of bringing this question. But I thought it was a good one. And Nima, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think that there's, 
there's the digital ecosystem, the crypto ecosystem is, is really, it's really intriguing because there are so many use cases that can, are made possible by that, that are not, were not possible for. One of the annoying things is that some of those use cases, some of the use case people propose are not things that even need right. you know, those kinds of solutions, but there are some, some, some unique solutions that could be provided by that. Some of those, these decentralized identity solutions could, could potentially make a lot of sense. But I think there's also a general trend towards people owning more digital assets that's happening right now. And who knows how long this continues for, but if there continue to be tens of billions, hundreds of billions, maybe trillions of dollars in digital assets, there is a real question of where those assets are going to be custodied. And so if you're a financial services firm and you start to see your the consumer assets move from cash and stock, which is what, you know, a traditional bank might help you with over to digital assets and those sit somewhere else, that's a real, as you're just not being able to serve their customer for that third leg if that becomes a a core part of society's holdings. And so I I don't have a strong view on the short term of what things are good, you know, what what are good digital assets, what are bad digital assets, but there seems to be enough momentum around digital assets that I don't know exactly which ones will be successful, but in 10 years, it will be a significant part of the holdings of consumers. And so in that world, I think that there is an opportunity for Blend to play as the software layer, again, for that, to help our customers, whether they're fintechs or, or banks or credit unions, whatever it is, make sure that they can serve the consumer in that third leg. So when you think of cryptocurrencies as a whole, do you see that as a threat to the financial ecosystem? Because you, know, you work with a lot of banks and of course other institutions as well, but a lot, you think of like a Wells Fargo, a very traditional bank. Are cryptocurrencies, do you think in just your opinion, a threat to the financial e- ecosystem as we know it, or can they coexist? I mean, j- just like with any other change, if, if this change happens, and again, I'm not omniscient, I don't know what's going to happen. And, and right. it's like, we'll see what happens. But if, it, if the change happens, if companies that are existing companies that have a lot of customer base, a large customer base and, and a lot of scale, if they embrace the change and they work alongside it and they figure out how to serve their consumers in the areas they want, then I don't think it's a threat. Um, it's more that they'll coexist with new companies that come that have come up and you know you saw Coinbase has hundred billion dollars or so in assets that they're already holding. That's a pretty significant size financial institution already, uh, ten yeah. years in. And so, I think it, the ones who embrace it, if it becomes a bigger thing. Uh, will thrive and the ones who don't will probably struggle because their consumers will be putting their assets in places that can serve them more broadly from a financial service, from a financial health perspective. So piggyback off that, there's a lot of hype around this word. It's overused and sometimes misused. And I did a, d- a deep dive on this, the metaverse, right? So you think of the metaverse. So do you think that banks and or Blend Labs could be part of the metaverse ecosystem down the road? Now, let me, let me finish the question before you think I'm crazy asking it. I asked the question because many would argue that digital payments will be critical for the success of a metaverse. You think of, you immerse yourselves into a, into, a, into a virtual reality experience, and oftentimes you're going to have the ability to buy and sell digital assets. So you think of digital real estate, okay? Digital real estate's a real thing maybe in the future. NFTs, I know it's way down the road and you don't have a palantir, so to speak, to know what's going to happen, but just what are your thoughts on that overall? Is that something you can see Blend Labs being a part of that ecosystem or not? Well, I think to the extent that consumers start buying and holding digital assets, it goes back to the question I just answered, which is if they start buying and holding these digital assets, there's, there's got to be a really simple, straightforward way for consumers to see all their assets, not just their cash, not just their stocks but also their real estate and their digital assets as well. And so, and so I think that there's, there, is, there is something there where if those things start to happen at scale and the metaverse becomes as big as Facebook thinks it's going to be or Meta thinks it's going to be or, or a lot of the NFT companies think it's going to be, if it becomes that big, there's got to be a way to hold those assets really effectively in a, in a centralized way alongside your other assets. And so um, I do think that Blend... It, it, if that becomes a reality, Blend will be a big player in how we make sure that those assets can be um, supported alongside just any other asset that we already help. We already help you open wealth management accounts. We already help you open bank accounts. We already help you open lending accounts. And so why would this not be another account that we help you open and set up with your financial services provider, whether it's a fintech or a bank or a credit union? Yeah. So you have a lot of skin in the game as a founder and the way you're compensated for stock performance. And so- where do you see yourself in 10 years? Where do you see Blend Labs in 10 years? Because I know some of those goals. And if you get to those goals, it's, there's, there's a lot of incentive for you to do so. I mean, again, you can't predict the future, but just your opinion. Where do you see Blend Labs 10 years from now? Well, I definitely see myself here 10, 10 years from now. Let's start with that. 
But I think the real the reality for Blend is if we're successful at becoming this core infrastructure for banking and lending that is used by every bank, not just in this country, but in the world to open all these accounts, all the onboarding that's done, making sure a consumer can see all those things in one place, then I think we'll be sort of the, the next generation powered by, you know, think about like Intel inside. I don't expect us to be consumer facing. I don't expect us to be the one that's even any UI that's created by the banks or credit unions or whatever. I don't expect us to be that, but I expect us to be the quiet behind the scenes Intel inside that's powering these institutions to do those things extremely effectively, extremely frictionlessly across every transaction in the world. And so that would be my hope. And I think that'll drive two things that are really great. One, for existing bank consumers in the world, a better understanding of their financial picture so they can continue to make the right financial decisions and to get it access to the right products proactively provided to them by the financial institution. And then two, if we drive friction out of the ecosystem, I think the underbanked will greatly benefit in particular because there'll be so much opportunity to serve those people in the world that are not yet served by the banking systems because it's too complicated, it's too paper-based, too manual, requires branches in some cases. And so um, those, those two things, they actually make me think that financial services as a sector is much smaller than it could be if we took all the friction out of it. And so I, I expect that people have better financial lives because financial services will play a more central role to consumers' long-term financial lives. I want to respect your time. Just two quick fun questions here at the end to wrap it up. So the first one, do you have any favorite business influencers or maybe a mentor or something like that? Who do, who do you look up to? I mean, everybody has someone they look up to. Is there anybody in business, an Elon Musk or something like that? Who are your your influence uh, influences to be successful? Um, interesting. I have so many. I tend to look at what people are best in the world at, and I try to understand why they're best in the world at. Elon Musk is best in the world at something. Steve Jobs is best in the world at some things. Max from a firm is best in the world at some things. And I try to figure out like, what are they best in the world at? And I try to figure out like, how do I make that part of my DNA or learn from that and look at them and, and understand what they do. So some of it's, I think it's, there's a lot, there's not one, but there's a lot. And I try to figure out what's the best way for us to do this across all of them. So we talked earlier before we started recording about our teams and we made fun of the Falcons. I'm a Falcons fan, unfortunately, right? You grew up in the Cincinnati area. It's a really awesome backstory, by the way, you know, true American dream type story. So are you, are you a Warriors fan? Are you a, a Cavaliers fan then? Maybe you don't want to answer because you live in the Bay area, but I mean, you have to pick a side there because Bengals, of course, you know, Cincinnati and you've got the Niners. Who, who do you root for? Do you root for both or how do you answer that? <laughs> I'm a Bengals fan and I don't have a specific NBA team. I have okay. allegiance to because Cincinnati doesn't have an NBA team, but I'm a huge NBA fan broadly. Okay. I love basketball. It's one of the most exciting games. You get to see it and see the action in person. It's really great. Good answer. Well, Nima, I want to respect your time. I appreciate it very much being here. It's been a pleasure talking with you today. And I hope you have a great day and good luck with everything at Blend Labs. Yeah. Thanks so much, Eric. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye.